When I was 23 year, years old, I came into contact with Family Church and it very quickly became my home. And over the next few months, I got to know Pastor Paul and spent some time with him. And then that first summer, Paul called me and said, hey, we have an opportunity that we thought you might like to be a part of. There's a thing called the Global Leadership Summit where all of the great leaders of the world come and they get to speak and we get to be a part of it. It's a simulcast. It comes out of Chicago and we're going to go up to Portland. We're going to get to listen uh, to the Leadership Summit. Would you like to come be a part of that? And when he called, I thought it was such an honor. And, and I had always had some part in like a connection to leadership. And as we went, it was a wonderful time getting to hear these amazing leaders. Some of them were followers of Jesus and they led churches and others were leaders in the business world. And over the next few years, I got to be a part of the Global Leadership Summit a number of times. And one of the speakers that really um, touched me is a guy who's actually not a follower of Jesus. He's a seeker, uh, but he is a professor of leadership at the Stanford School of Business. And his name is Jim Collins. And one of the interesting things about him is that Jim Collins uh, wrote a book because he looked at a number of organizations and he said, there are some organizations that are just what you would call good or mediocre. And in the process of being mediocre, something changes and they skyrocket. They move from good to great. In fact, he wrote a book called Good to Great. Now, when you think about whatever organization you're a part of, whether or not it's a school or a business or a church, for the most part, if we say, is the, is the organization you're a part of good? Most of us say, yeah, it's good. Raise your hand if you're a part of a good organization. Okay, good. So as a general rule, we're a part of a good organization. How many of you would love it if your organization moved to great? Yeah, all of us. So you get this book and it says things like, good is the enemy of great. There are five levels of leadership. There's a thing called the hedgehog principle. If you want to sell a book about leadership, find an obscure animal and make a principle about it. That's what he did in this. And his idea was that every organization can move from good to great. And as I reflected on that, it has some great principles. There's some that were very applicable and some that challenged me. But I was thinking about the idea of an organization that's good, that wants to be great, versus what we're talking about in this sermon series. Because we're talking about something that isn't good or great, but something that's unstoppable. And I want you to catch the heart of this, that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth, and connected with us, and called us into a mission, and not an organization, but an organism that is unstoppable. Now, it's interesting, whenever I say that the church is unstoppable, for the most part, many of us go, uh, are you kidding me? Because we've all been a part of churches that have been very stoppable. In fact, all it took was the color of the carpet and an argument, and suddenly the church seemed to wither and die. But I don't, I don't mean a context of a local church. I mean the church of Jesus, the church of God is unstoppable. In fact, I want you to see it this way. That from the 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ was on earth, he died on the cross and rose from the dead, and he set up the church from that 2,000 years ago to now, there has been an unbroken chain between them and us of a powerful, unstoppable force. And Satan has tried to use every trick in the book to stop every one of those churches. But the underlying current is that God wins in the end. And really what we're trying to do is to say in the middle of this sermon series on being unstoppable is are we joining him in that? So last week we talked about what it meant uh, to be the people of God the body and the bride. And there are ways we can partner and be a part of this special unstoppable force, or we can just bend towards the norm, drift downstream, have fights about the color of carpet and the type of music, or we can be a part of something amazing and something special. And today we're going to look at another aspect of that where the church can, can connect its heart with what Jesus is doing. And we're going to look at a special um, aspect of, of God. In fact, when we look at, uh, at our relationship with God, we believe there's one God, but we believe that he is three persons. It's called the Trinity. And in fact, the Trinity is a, a phrase that is not actually in the Bible. It's a description of how we see God because there are three parts or three persons in God. There's one God, but three persons. And the first is God the Father. This is the one that we often think of as the cosmic entity. When I was a kid, I always pictured Father God as um, big, sitting on a cloud, and had a really big beard. Now, the Bible doesn't say anything like that, but that's often how I would perceive him. Second part of it is, um, the second person, I should say, is Jesus. And he's the one that we often connect with the most. And why is that? Well, there are four books of the Bible that describe him living on earth. 
You see, this is the, the, the cool thing about the Trinity is when you have Jesus, he is fully God and fully man. It's called the hypostatic union, that he is both of them at the exact same time. And he came and lived on earth. And the reason I can connect with him so much easier than the other two is because he walked in Galilee. I know that he walked on water and he turned water into wine. And I know those stories. I know that his body was shredded and that he was nailed to a cross and that he died for me. So in some ways, it's easiest for me to connect with Jesus. But there's a third part, and he's probably the least known, and that's the one we're going to focus on today. It's the Holy Spirit. And the first four books of the New Testament are about Jesus. They tell of him being born on Christmas and rising from the dead on Easter. But the rest of the New Testament, I would say, 23 other chapters, I would say that the main character in them is actually the Holy Spirit. He's the least known of, of the of the um, aspects of God, and I want us to focus in on him today. We're going to be in Romans 8 for most of this time. And here's what I think. If we can connect our hearts with the Holy Spirit more clearly, we will join that unstoppable force. If our hearts are aligned with the Holy Spirit and what he is doing and the ministry he's doing inside of us as we are moving along, we will join that unstoppable force. So the first aspect of this is I just want to lay the foundation of what all of us go through. First thing I want you to notice about us is there's this thing in the world, there's this thing in us, and there's this thing we have to deal with. It's called sin. And let me give you the universal thing that happens when sin happens. There's something that follows. We feel bad. All right? There's a guilty conscience. We know we did something wrong. If you don't feel bad, the odds are one of two things. Either you're very calloused, or you didn't know what you did. But when you know there's sin and you have wronged someone or you have just done something that is counter to what you believe is right, even if you have no relationship with Jesus, if you do something that you know is wrong, you feel bad. So I don't walk through this and I want to show you what the Holy Spirit does with this aspect. Because if we handle a response to this in line with the Holy Spirit, we join in that unstoppable force. If not, we end up having fights about carpet. And the church grinds to a halt. So I want to show you this. So look at what it says in Romans 8. This starts in, in just the very beginning because he deals with sin and feeling bad. Look at this. This is what he says. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Do you hear that? You know what I heard there? We don't have to feel bad anymore. Oh, careful. That is not what it says. In fact, I want to walk through this with you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it goes on. Here's why. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, here's our guy, the Holy Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Here's the myth. That because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me, I don't have to feel bad anymore. That's not true. It's what we do with those bad feelings. Because here's, here's the idea. When we, when we sin, we feel bad. One option is to move into condemnation. Well, condemnation often has something that follows. It comes with shame, it comes with blame, and it often comes with hiding. There's a, a, an awesome Bible story that, that depicts this perfectly. There's this married couple, and they're hanging out in their backyard, just spending some time in the garden, and their neighbor yells out and says, hey, uh, you got to try this fruit. It's amazing. And the, the lady's like, hey, yo, uh, God said we ain't supposed to touch that. And this neighbor's pretty crafty, and he's trying to get them off their game, and he says to them, no, 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 it's great. You know why God doesn't want you to eat it? He doesn't want you to eat it because he knows if you eat this, you're going to know good from evil just like him. So the, the, the lady goes, wow, well, it looks tasty. And it sounds like it's good for gaining wisdom. She takes it. She takes a bite, hands it to her husband. Her husband eats it. And both of them realize something. They just sinned. And then they feel bad. And then they go to condemnation. And the next thing they did is they ran and they hid. Try to cover up. Nothing to see here. And then finally God has a conversation with him and says, why are you hiding? And then the next game comes. Because the shame came, so they hid. Well, now we play the next game, which is called blame. See, we, we sin, we feel bad, now we go into condemnation. Well, after hiding, then the conversation goes this way. Why did you do that? And the wife, her name is Eve, said, well, the serpent deceived me. She blamed the serpent. God looked at Adam and said, why did you do that? And he said, well, two problems. One, you gave me that wife and she gave it to me. 
he blames God and he blames his wife. Why? Because he, walking in sin, feels bad and he's trying to deal with it. First, with shame and hiding. Second, with blaming. Yeah, because the natural state is to sin and feel bad. And then the Holy Spirit says to us in Romans 8, Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Does that mean that all of this is wiped out? No, it's a different option, but you got to hear this. It doesn't erase this. There is a horrible feeling that happens when we choose sin. And as we choose that sin, there's another aspect, another option, which is called conviction. And there's another story from the Bible that answers that question. It's the story of a, of a king who sees his neighbor's wife and says, hmm, I like her. And so he takes her. She gets pregnant. He tries to cover up. His first move fits in this realm right over here. It fits in condemnation. First, he tries to cover it up by bringing the husband home who's out at the battlefield. But then over a course of time, that doesn't work. So he has his friend and neighbor, one of his inner circle, one of his 30 mighty men, he has Uriah assassinated in battle. Now everything's fine because all the hiding worked. Except you, you, you want to know just something real quick? You can't hide from God because he sees what you think no one else knows. And so God sends Nathan and says to him, hey, David, I know what you did. You took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and you killed him. And then David responds, not here. But the Spirit moves him here. And I, I, I can't prove this, but this is what I see him doing. I see him get on his knees and deal with it. He writes Psalm 51. And in the process of Psalm 51, it's one of the most beautiful examples of conviction. He says, create in me a clean heart. He acknowledges the problem. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And cast me not away from your presence. Pull me back in. I was wrong. See, here's what happens. When we sin and feel bad, feeling bad that leads to conviction that says I was wrong leads to life change. Over here, this leads to shame and blame and hiding. Over here, this leads to repentance, confession, and life change. One is hiding. The other is healing. And the difference is everything. See, here's what I want you to see about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit leads us to repent. It leads us to turn from sin and to go the other way. And when it says there's no condemnation, it doesn't mean, hey, you don't have to feel bad. No, you do. But what do you do with it? Because if running and hiding comes, you will never come into the light. Notice what happened there with Adam and Eve. Separation, distance from God. There was something now between them. Look what David does. With the same horrible feelings, he moves forward into relationship. I have a a dear, dear friend who felt this nudge of the Holy Spirit. And he told him, the Holy Spirit told him, you need to deal with your sin. He was at a men's retreat and there was a speaker who was talking about addiction, sexual addiction. And he challenged him and said, the Holy Spirit challenged him and said, you need to step into the light. You need to go tell your wife what's happening. And if you've ever had something that's been a hidden sin, And you hear the Holy Spirit say, you need to go and bring it to the light. It is a scary thing. And at the moment, the Holy Spirit said that, I don't think my friend felt peace. But he knew that he was called to. Because here's what the Holy Spirit does. And here's what conviction does. It moves us towards the light. Think about how much this echoes out of your relationship with Jesus. How did you come into relationship with Jesus? The first step is we had to admit that we're sinners. Then we had to believe that he really lived and died. Then we have to commit our life. It begins with admitting we're sinners. It's interesting that we think that it happens at the beginning, but we wouldn't have to do it in the middle, in the process. Part of the changing in our hearts happens when we choose to step forward and say, I was wrong. I sinned. There's no excuse. There's no explanation. I can't defend it. It's sin. That's what I did. And that's what David does. And that's what my friend did. Interestingly enough, my friend had another friend and both of them were at the same retreat. Both of them felt the conviction they needed to go home and tell their wives. Now, this was very scary for my friend because he didn't know if his wife was going to leave him. 
but he chose to say, the Holy Spirit's telling me and I have to go with him. I'm leaning into relationship with the Holy Spirit. And if it costs me, I'll still go. Well, my friend's other friend, both of them went to their wives. My friend found grace, found healing and restoration. It deeply wounded his wife. And yet she forgave and grace was offered and grace was received. His friend went to his wife and she divorced him. Here's what's hard. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit calls us to go and make it right, it doesn't pull away the consequences. And there were severe consequences for both of them. A deeply wounded wife, another deeply wounded wife, a broken marriage. All of that was there because of the sin, not because they went forward and were honest. If you want to have real relationships, it has to be in the light. Hiding can't be part of the process for any of this. It comes with truth. So the first thing I want us to remember is that the Holy Spirit leads us to repent. And think about this now as we talk about the unstoppable force. I want you to think at every campus, for those of you in South Umpqua, imagine what it would look like if South Umpqua and Sutherland and Green and all of you watching online, if every one of us walked in the light this week, if every one of us that had a hidden sin stepped forward and said, I need to talk with you. When I was in high school, there was an old worship song that meant a lot to me. It's an old, old song. I never heard it anywhere else, but in that small context. And it was just the song called I'll Obey. And it said, I'll obey and serve you. I'll obey uh, to show it's the way that I love you. And at the very end of it, it says, I'll obey. If it costs me everything, I'll obey. And I love that line, if it costs me everything. I think there's another line there. It said, for it's the way to prove my love when feelings go away. If it costs me everything, I'll obey. There's no relationship if hiding is a component in your life with it. So we have to step forward and the church is transformed when we live in the light. There's another aspect of what the Holy Spirit does in the church coming from Romans 8 that I want you to see. And it's here in in verse six. This has to do with our daily relationship, not just the things that have to do with sin like we just talked about, but how we relate to the world, how we relate to each other, how we relate to the decisions we make. Listen to what it says. The mind governed by the flesh is dead, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Stop and think about what that just said there. If I am governed by, the, by the way, the flesh is a, a description of what it means to have my own desires. It doesn't mean my actual flesh on my body. It means my personal desires. If I live by that, I'm dead meat. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and And peace, and the first thing that I want you to see coming out of this is that the Holy Spirit guides us daily, in daily relationships. Go back to the idea of the unstoppable force. What would it look like if every one of us had our lives being guided by the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our life? How transformative would that be? How much more aligned with this unstoppable force would we be? As I was uh, reflecting on this, I was talking with a friend of mine, and he he was saying, you know what this reminds me of? In Psalm 32, verse 80, it talks about that he guides us with his eye on us. And we were talking about how, you know how fathers can simply look a certain way at their kids and the kids know what the father means. There's this connective way that guiding happens. And I don't just mean the look, you know, like, and they know they're in trouble. I I mean it differently than that. And I saw this about a week and a half ago. Uh, We were doing, we have a little girl's Bible study at our house on Wednesday afternoons. And we, had, we were playing uh, this game where there was an obstacle course and the, and the girls had to work together. And in the course of it, one of them had to go from one, swing from one place to the next and she fell off. She ended up scraping her leg. And so she stepped out of the game. And my daughter looked at me and what she was asking me was, should I go help dad? And all I did was look like this. I nodded one inch to the right. And my daughter went, and she headed off to go help. I didn't have to say a word. When she looked at me, I knew she was asking. When she looked at me, she knew what I was saying. The look led, I think there's so much like that in our relationship with God and with the Holy Spirit. Notice how it works out. And this can be misleading. So you need to follow me all the way with this. It says the mind governed by the flesh is dead, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. There's an aspect of this that in the wrestling of well, God's calling us, that there's an inner peace that feels very different than norm. And I want to give you just some observations that I make, that I've made about the Holy Spirit. And as I give these, I want you to, I want to tell you that these are my observations. I'm not getting them from um, the Bible. Okay. I don't have a direct verse for these, but I think that they're worth mentioning. 
The first one is that oftentimes when the Holy Spirit is speaking to me in this piece, it's counter to what I would normally do. Case in point, let's say that you're a very shy person and you feel a nudging in your soul that says, go talk to that person. And you would think to yourself, why in the world am I thinking that? I would never do that. Or maybe you're a little bit more miserly and you're not going to, you don't give often. And you feel a prompting inside of you to give money to something. That's probably the Holy Spirit. Now, understand this. That prompting will always line up with the Bible. It will never lead you to sin. The Holy Spirit has never led anyone towards sin. So if you have a, feel like there's a prompting in you to go have an affair, that's not the Holy Spirit. That would be the flesh which leads to death. Okay, so number one, if it feels different than what you would normally do. The second thing that I just noticed in this is that when we look at the Holy Spirit leading to peace, I've noticed that the Holy Spirit, I've never seen it lead into fear. You know, the, the, the main question that we ask in fear is what if? Well, what if, what if I get lost? What if we lose the job? What if the house is foreclosed on? What if, what if, what if? Now, if you're in a what if mode, how peaceful do you feel? In fact, me just doing that, some of you went, <clears throat> and you felt tension right now. Well, as you're feeling that tension, now just stop and think. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Because I don't think the Spirit brings you questions like, what if? I got a buddy of mine who, uh, he was walking through the kitchen late at night, so it was dark. And there's a hole in his house because they're doing a little remodel. Now, I've been to that hole, and I have a little tiny head, so I could fit my head in there, barely. But no human could fit in there. But when he walked by that hole, he stepped to the side because in his mind he was asking, what if? There's someone in there and they grab me. Well, what was he asking? Now, do you think the Holy Spirit is saying, be careful of that hole? No. <laughs> what is transpiring there is a what if question. Now, all of that to say, when we talk about this piece, it doesn't mean that there's not a wrestling. Um, I, you can manufacture peace. You can talk yourself into being peaceful when in actuality, it's not the Holy Spirit telling you that you're okay. And this is one of the things that I am so would love for family church to buy into, for you personally to buy into, that we practice hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying, not manufactured by our own stories and our own narrative, but what is God saying to us specifically? Uh, I, I, I was so blessed and touched watching the process of Pastor Zach over the last year, partly because I was watching him in connection with the Holy Spirit. You know, this entire idea that he walking in peace and that the Holy Spirit guides us. And one of the things that happened was he was feeling a nudging that he needed to make a decision to go back into the corporate world or to stay on staff at Family Church. And he knew he couldn't do both. And so he had to make a decision. And so one of the things he did is he just tried it on looking for that peace. Now, this was a wrestling match with God. It wasn't simple. So the first month he said, I'm going to say in my heart, I'm going to stay at Family Church. And he just tried it on for a month. And that was his mindset. What is the Holy Spirit saying in response to this? Then the next month, he changed the mindset and said, I'm going to, thinking that I'm going to go back into the corporate world and bring my ministry there. And in the process of that, the first night, he slept through the night. His mindset was at peace and he was trying on both of them. And this is what I would say that I saw happening that it wasn't easy either way. The mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. He had a calm in him. Now, did that make it easy? No, he had to come and tell all of us, I'm going to be stepping off the team. Well, there was a tension in that, but the overall part is deeper. There's a deeper peace than what's manufactured. One of the things that I've noticed about this guiding principle of the Holy Spirit is what do you do when everything's hard? And it seems it's actually where we practice it most. Yeah, Galatians 5, is probably the most famous verse about the Holy Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. The idea being that if the Spirit is working in you, what is the fruit that that will produce in your life? It's one of the most beautiful scriptures. But I was looking at it again yesterday, and I noticed something about it that really kind of shook me. And I want to walk through it with you. I was looking at it. It's, it's right here. I was noticing so many of these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. When do they come out? They come out when you're not sitting on a beach with a blended mocha and an umbrella over your head and you have nothing to do and nothing to worry about. Look at, look at where they come out. I want to walk this through with you. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And then notice the second one is joy. 
well, I don't know if you catch what joy is. Joy is being okay when circumstances are. Happiness is going, I'm on a beach, I've got a blended mocha and an umbrella over my head and nothing to do. I'm happy because everything's fine. Joy's not that. Joy is when everything's broken. And that's one of the fruit of the Spirit. Look at the next one. Peace. I don't need peace if I'm on a beach. When do I need peace? And when there's tension, when there's turmoil. Now, now stop and think about this. Not the beach kind of peace, but I want you to imagine a marriage being ripped apart in an inner core that said, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And working inside of me is a peace that's beyond the circumstances. Think of the next one, patience. When do you need patience? When you don't have what you want now. And that's the working of the Holy Spirit. Look at another one. Faithfulness. When, when does faithfulness come in? When you have a desire to step out of what you are called to. There's this great song called Dancing Through the Minefields by Andrew Peterson. It's about marriage. And he talks about the difficulty in marriage. And the essence of faithfulness comes out with this, this simple phrase. That's what the promises are for. Stop and think about your marriage. Have there not been times when it would have been way easier to tuck, turn tail, and run? And yet, what does the Holy Spirit give us? It gives us faithfulness. But when? When it's hard. And, and then the last one that really stands out to me, that he gives us self-control. And when is it that we get self-control and need it most? When we want to do something we shouldn't. Notice the aspects of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. They often transpire and come out. They are brought to the surface when it's difficult. And I want to encourage you with that. That at the very moment when you need him most, that's exactly when he's working. And I'll tell you, I love sitting on a beach with a blended mocha and the umbrella over my head. Those are great moments, but they are rare. And if you're living looking for circumstantial peace, you will miss the peace that comes here from the Holy Spirit. Now stop and think again about that unstoppable force that for the last 2,000 years, God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit have been working through church throughout history. And as you, as you process that and you're looking at that and you're evaluating that, what would it look like if when crisis comes, this is how I respond? If economies crash, and this is how I respond. Pandemics come, and this is how I respond. I would love to tell you that this is exactly how I've responded over the last year and a half, but it isn't true. And God has had to do a work in me. God has had to challenge me. And I have to go back to that first part about seeing my sin. And sometimes I think I'm finding that it's revealed where my sin is uh, right here when I see that these things are missing. When the fruit of the Spirit isn't evident, but the fruit of me is. So we've talked so far that this Holy Spirit leads us to repentance and this Holy Spirit guides us. How beautiful and critical that is. But there's another part that I think is so desperate for us to know. And I think it causes more damage than we know. And for some of you, this may be exactly what you need to hear. I want to speak a truth to you that you need to know. You are going to die. And I am going to die. And there's one critical question that echoes through all eternity is what have you done with Jesus and what is your relationship with Jesus? And I want to talk to you if you've become a follower of Jesus, of a peace that you can have because of the Holy Spirit. The simple story is that we are sinful and that we deserve death and we deserve hell, but Jesus Christ came and died for us and connected us with God. But there are some people here that feel like they are afraid that even though they've given their life to Jesus, that that's not enough. And they are afraid that if they die, they're not sure if they will have a, that, that they will get to go to heaven in that relationship. And I want to walk through with you some of the most reassuring things you'll ever hear. And this comes from Romans 8 and Ephesians 1. Listen carefully to this. It starts in verse 15. And this, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship and by him, by him, that's the Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. And it goes on in 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And here's what I want you to hear. Jesus with his blood purchased you, but not because you were on sale. Jesus Christ ransomed you. And I want you to know this. 
there's a no return policy. You know what I love about Costco? Virtually anything you get there, no matter what happens to it, you can almost always take it back. Let me tell you, Jesus is not at all like Costco. He does not take returns. He has bought you and you are his. You can, he will never give you back. And here's the mark for it. The Holy Spirit tells us that we become sons locked in. I was talking with Pastor Drew about this. And this might be news for some of you at the other campus. But Pastor Drew, he's our kids pastor at the Green Campus. Um, for the last, it seems like 1,800 years, they've been waiting in process to adopt their child, Dean. And over the last month, the adoption has been finalized which means he cannot be taken from their home. And I was talking with him about the difference in feeling because they work in foster care and they've had children that they have had part of their family and loved and held and cherished and, and had to hold them with an open hand. As the system works and the system processes and the system has taken some away. But Dean, Dean is a catch -em. And Dean can't be taken away. In the same way, let me give you this assurance. You, if you've become a follower of Jesus, are a child of God. And one of my favorite verses that says this so well, this talks about it as a picture of sonship. Uh, Ephesians uses it as an economic term. Look what it says here. Oh, first, I want you to write down on your, on your outline. The Holy Spirit seals us. Look what it says here in in Ephesians 1, it says, when you believed, when you became a follower, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, economic term, guaranteeing your inheritance. When you asked Jesus to lead your life, the Holy Spirit came in and he changed your spiritual DNA. It cannot be undone. And I'll tell you, one of the, the things I've watched with great tragedy, there are some organizations, or there are some churches that when they look at scripture, that the way that they interpret scripture is that when you become a follower, there's a danger that you could lose it. I don't ag agree with that interpretation of the Bible. They're my brothers in Christ and I love them dearly, but I'd see this differently. And one of the, the things that I think is sad is watching people who come from that background often live with a far greater fear because when they're coming close to death, they're not sure, am I getting in seems to be the question. I had a, we used to have a dog. I'm, I'm not a huge pet guy, but I've learned to be a little bit more. But uh, we had the worst dog ever, like the spawn of Satan. I just couldn't stand that dog. There's one time we had the dog over at my in-laws and it got out and got away. So we had to go chase it down. Well, it ran over to the neighbors and I ended up chasing that dog that I thought was from Satan right into a special conversation. There was a group of people out, our neighbors or my in-laws neighbors were out and they were talking and as they had got the dog for me, but I ended up in a conversation with them about a family member that was knocking on death's door and he was scared. He had had a background in knowing about Jesus, but what he didn't have was an assurance that said, you are marked with a seal, a deposit guaranteeing. He didn't see that. He didn't know that. And I said, would you go talk to him? And so I went and talked with him and it was a precious time. I only had one conversation with him. And in that conversation, his lungs were so gone that he couldn't have any verbal response back. But I got to walk him back through that he believed that he was a sinner. He believed that Jesus lived a perfect life and died for him. And that he committed his life to him. And I walked him back through the truth that because he had made those choices, he was sealed. There was a deposit inside of him, the promised Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. Do you know how different the church would be if we had this component? What makes us an unstoppable force is when we don't have to live in fear. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Guess where punishment is? It's been paid. And how different we would act, how different our church would be if we lived out these three principles of what we see in the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit that lives in us leads us to repentance. And what if we followed like that? And the second one is that we let him guide us where our decision-making was saying, what is the Holy Spirit saying? And then finally, we lived at a peace. It says, I'm a child of God. And there's no return policies here. 
I want us to reflect on this, and we're going to give a little bit more challenges at each of our campuses. And for those of you online, hang with me. I love you guys.